everybody hear me clearly? So, before we start, um, I'd like to have your uh, your name on a paper, so I can have a look at it afterwards. So, just put your name on and your um, affiliation. So, if you're um, from GIFT, write down GIFT. If you're from Material Science or any other department, write MSNE or whatever. And please use nice, nice script so I can read what your name. Yes. All right. Um, so a number of things. Um, the material will be on the E-class uh, site. Yes. There's nothing today, so don't uh, look for it as yet. Um, the that's one thing. The other thing is the, the course is being taped, right? So if you want to look at it again, because you missed something or, um, or you missed the class, uh, you can always um, have a look at it, right? Um, and um, so please refrain from, you know, using your mobile phone or something. Um, so the um, the class is um, is uh, n also um, nice and easy uh, to watch without disturbances. Um, let me review a number of other uh, points as we start. Um, if you want to uh, have a textbook that goes with the course, there is a book called Fundamentals of Steel Products Physical Metallurgy. It's available from uh, AIST.org and you can order it uh, on this site and the price is $50. Um, it's a um, soft cover and it, there's a lot of material from the course in there but not everything. But that's a good book to have if you would um, want a textbook for this course. You don't need to buy it. All the material we discuss will be in the slides that will be on the site, E-class site, okay? Right, um, then some uh, organizational points. We meet here twice a week at 11 o'clock, yeah, on Tuesday and on Thursday. And uh, we start at 11, we finish at 12.15, yes? room 401. Um, I don't have, for uh, my courses, I don't use exams or midterms. We do one quiz every week. So on Thursday morning, we take 10, excuse me, we take 15 minutes for a short quiz about the material from uh, the two previous classes, yes? So you don't need to, you just need to keep up with the material, okay? So that gives you uh, over the, the entire um, uh, semester, you will have about 100 to 150 questions that you will have answered, and that is plenty. Um, I also use, um, in order to avoid uh, having a language bias, yes, the, uh, the questions are either multiple choice or yes and no questions, right, or very simple calculations, all right? Okay, so there is, there is uh, very little language bias to the, the tests also. Hmm? It's just um, if you're worried about the number of um, uh, quizzes, right? You can miss one or two quizzes, you know, because you're sick or, you know, you have to go to conference or um, you have, there's an experiment you have to do out of town. So I will understand that, yes? If you miss more than two quizzes, you're in trouble, okay? So that's the, I the idea is uh, that you, you take the quizzes. All right. What, what is the essence of the course? You know, when I designed the course, what was the big idea? 
Okay, so most of you uh, or all of you are either in material science or in steel research, yes? And so what this course offers you is the big picture about steel products, right? So uh, most of you are either master's degree students or PhD students. You're involved in, actively involved in research, but research tend to be very focused by its nature. So you will be working on partitioning of molybdenum, you know, to carbide in a heat resistant steel. It's a very tiny little bit of science you'll be working on, yes? And some of you may be doing this study of this partitioning by modeling. So the, the course offers you the opportunity to see you know, where your research fits in from a steel products point of view. Yes, because there are, we easily talk about steels, but there are many steels, there are very many applications, and the steels are very different. Yes, so what's the big picture? So although this is not a traditional material science course, you know, we try to use this um, material science, well-known material science tetrahedron, yes, where there is a balance between looking at the microstructure of the material, looking at how the microstructure evolves or is uh, created during uh, processes, um, such as, uh, for instance, here, a forging, and then looking at the properties of our steels, yes, and also looking at their engineering performance in service. And for instance, when we talk about uh, mechanical properties of steels for automotive, crash resistance is a, would be an application uh, performance parameter. Hmm? So we'll try to, um, to also incorporate this view, um, this holistic view in, in, in the course. Hmm? All right. Right. So at this, for the start here, for the first couple of lectures, we'll just do rehearsing just to make sure everybody has the concepts, uh, knows the concepts. So we'll, we'll be talking about the fundamentals for the, the first classes. So we'll talk about you know, compos things like compositions of steel, steel crystal structure, microstructure, strength from a very general point of view. So, and, um, and and this will allow us to uh, set the stage for the relationship between properties and microstructures and also how the microstructure is generated in uh, mainly thermal cycles and thermal cycles which in evol involve mainly what we call the decomposition of austenite. Hmm? All right, and also also show you through examples that um, you know what how how you go about getting these properties in practice. All right. Um, so this course is not a basic core introductory level course. You know, if you're looking for a basic introductory level course, this is not it. I assume that you already have considerable amount of you know, knowledge and you feel familiar with you know, material science concepts such as diffusion. You know, I'm not going to explain to you what diffusion is. Yes, I assume you know what it is and um, what controls it. Okay, so this is not a course about fundamentals. Right. So, at the uh, beginning, I just want to uh, 
stress, uh, or discuss rather, um, a, uh, an aspect of, of steels. It's like, why is it that um, today here in Pohang we have like a whole institute devoted to um, steel science and uh, training in uh, steel research? Uh, you know what makes you know steel so you know special that you know you, you have steel institutes uh, across the world working on this material. Well, first of all, I want to 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 show you how how big the material is. Um, and this is for instance this is a graph here where I show you the steel production in millions of tons per year. Yes as a function of the time here and up to say uh, 1970s which is about 40 years ago um, levels of steel production had reached around um, 600 million tons a year yes and um, nowadays um, we are uh, we will probably reach three times that amount, yes, 1,800 yes, million tons, yes, 1.8 billion tons a year of steel production, yes. That is a incredible, first of all, incredible increase, yes, but it's, uh, in um, growth rate in steel production. Uh, but it's also, you know, a huge, a massive amount of material. So steel, st steel is the material that we not only make most of in terms of weight, but also in terms of volume, yes? And uh, lots of it is driven by economic growth, of course, which, we, you know, steel gets, gets produced um, because it's used, yes? You never forget that, yes? Uh, you, know, you do steel research and you uh, work in steel plants because somebody else out there uses this material and needs it. Yes? So an example, for instance, are um, the automotive industry, yes? Automotive industry. Uh, and you can see how the, the trends in the number of cars produced every year uh, in the world uh, follows very closely the steel production, yes? And so it's very important for you to realize that the, it's not the car production that follows the steel production. It's the steel production who follows the growth in the car's demand, okay? Okay, it's very important here. That's the driver is economic growth. Yeah. So, how many cars do we produce per year in the world? 70 million cars per year. 70 million cars per year, yes? Uh, so that's a huge number and it's growing. Hmm? It goes up and down, of course. This is, for instance, here, this dip here is the recent uh, financial crisis, yes? Um, but you can see the uh, numbers are back up. Yes, and will continue to grow, yes? This is only cars. This is a passenger cars. It doesn't, it doesn't include light trucks. It doesn't include trucks. It doesn't include all the, all the other transportation, means of transportations we use. Um, it's just basically your regular type of passenger cars here. All right. So uh, when we talk about steel, just uh, so uh, we talk about mostly carbon steels, and that's going to be the the core of the course. Yes, we'll be talking about carbon steels. Um, carbon steel families family has a little brother. Yes, uh, the stainless steels. That's in comparison. That's only the size of the stainless steel production is only a few percents, 
few percents of the amount uh, of the amount of steels produced every year. Okay. Stainless steels are steels which have a very different physical metallurgy. Yes, they're produced in a similar but different ways than carbon steels. So we will not talk about stainless steels in this course. If you want to hear and learn about stainless steels, there is a separate course on stainless steels at GIFT. So you, you, know, you can take that course and, and hear about these products, um, their physical metallurgy and their production. Um, yes? And usually, but it's not always the case, stainless steels are produced in plants separately from uh, carbon steels. But again, as I said, it's not always the case. You have smaller companies that will produce commercial grades, yes, using electric arc furnace roots, and they will produce both carbon steels and certain uh, very well known uh, stainless steels. Um, for which there is demand. Okay. So also the application areas for stainless steels and carbon steels are different. So they basically serve other industries. So if you look in the carbon steels, yes, uh, close to 70%, about 70% of the uh, carbon steels are used in, in um, transport. As I said, for instance, automotive, trucks, industry, lots of the steel goes in there. And there is, and the building industry. Hmm? Structures, civil engineering structures, buildings, etc. 22%. So these are two very big clients and well-defined clients of the steel industry, carb carbon steel industry. In the case of stainless steel, the process industry and the agricultural and food products industry use 40%. So these are very different clients. They make use of the fact that stainless steels are resistant to corrosion. Yes. And so, for instance, in food production, yes, it's extremely important that your, you know, the materials that come into contact with food are not contaminated in any way or form. So, for instance, uh, if you visit a milk processing plant, for instance, yes, everything is made out of stainless steel, yes? Okay. There's no carbon steel being used. So, different clients, different metallurgies, and so we will not be, ta we'll be talking about these um, carbon steels in the course of the uh, uh, lectures. Now, um, again, let's have a look at numbers here, yes? So you get an idea of what it means to produce 1.8 billion tons of steel per year, okay? In an integrated steel company, hmm, that's a company like Posco Guangyang plant, yes? Um, in the steel plant, we produce steel by treatment of the iron in a process that's called the oxygen, um, uh, the BOF, excuse me, the uh, basic oxygen furnace process. Yeah. In this process, you make, depending on the steel plant and the technology, 250 tons to 400 tons about every half an hour. Yes? 24 hours per day, 200, excuse me, 365 days per year. Yes? In one furnace. Yes? There are many furnaces. 
plas uh, uh, basic oxygen furnaces in integrated plants. Um, if these in plant like um, Pohang works, um, we produce flat flat products, yes, such as uh, coils, yes. These 250 to 400 tons are translated into 10 coils of 250 tons or 11 coils of 36 tons, yes. 36 tons being a kind of big coil, but... So the length of these coils varies 27,000 meters. So if you uncoil this, you have 27 kilometers of material, yes? Or 40,000 square meters of material. That is being produced every 30 minutes, okay? So we're talking about huge amounts of material, yes? That's one of the strengths of the steel as a material is that it's available. Because obviously we were talking about Pohang, but there are many companies like this in China, Japan, um, Western Europe, North America that produce at this same rate, yes? So we produce huge amounts of steel, so the consumption is very high, yes? And if you plot the consumption of steel as a function of, uh, consumption of materials, yes, as a function uh, of the price, you also see that steel has very low price. Yes, it's a very available material and it's also a very low cost material, yes, okay. And just so you, uh, you can see here that uh, steel is at the top here, then you have uh, plastics, of course, aluminum, structural plastic, composites, magnesium, epoxy composites, titanium. Yeah. So we use uh, very many other materials than steels. Uh, but the, whenever we do this, yes, uh, in many applications, um, the advantage of the low cost and the availability of the material is very important, yes. Okay. Right. So, for instance, in the car industry uh, today, Yes, um, you use steels to make very many parts. Yes, um, in powertrain parts. You can see here uh, springs for suspension, springs for the engines. Yes, uh, of course mechanical parts for transmissions. The motor here, wheels, exhaust systems, etc. Yeah. The, the main um, part of uh, the use of uh, steel is uh, body in white. About 40% of a car's weight is in um, is steel and is for the body, yes. But um, there are many, uh, a car, uh, many other materials are being used to make a car, yes? Even what we call a steel car, you know, contains many other materials, okay? Right? And so in particular, if you, uh, if you look at the uh, materials that are being used to make a traditional sedan, for instance, this, um, Chevy Avio, which is produced in Korea today, yes, uh, you know, we make uh, this, uh, the body of the car, 
yes, with the steels shown in this graph. And this graph shows the properties of these different steels, total elongation as tensile strength. You know from your material science uh, classes that whenever you have high strengths, materials tend to have low ductilities. It doesn't have to be this way. There are materials and there are steels that don't, for which this general rule does not apply. But it's, um, it does apply in the case of, of these steels here that we use. And, and you can see um, this is a, the, the, the properties of the steels that you use are very different. You have very soft steels, about 300 megapascal in tensile strength. Yes, and you have very hard steels, hmm? up to 1,600 uh, megapascal in strength. And then these steels can have softer ones, have very high plasticity, they're very ductile. If you make a tensile specimen and you test it, 40, 45% of elongation. The harder materials, much less um, plasticity, have much less plasticity. But you can um, replace steel with other materials, yes? Um, the car industry, again, the car industry doesn't use steel because, this, because the steel industry tells it to, yes? Yeah. The car industry has nothing to do with steel industry, yes? They just use materials to make cars. So there I have alternative materials are available to the car industry hmm? to, uh, to do their material selection. They can use aluminum alloys, they could use titanium alloys, if they could use magnesium alloys, they do, yes. Uh, they could use polymers, they can use um, very strong uh, carbon fiber reinforced composites, yes. And they do, they do. Let me show you, for instance, here. Uh, so these aluminum alloys um, are used to, uh, so you, you, there are different ways, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there are different ways in which you can make cars. You can make cars in the, the monocoque concept where you have the, the body of the car is also the structure of the car, yes? The, the, or you can have a space frame concept where you first build the frame and then you put, and that's going to be the, the structure of the, the structural backbone of the car, and then you put external parts on the, on, on uh, uh, body parts on this frame, yes? So there are different uh, alloys that are being used, different uh, materials that are, that are being used, yes. Uh, so of course, if you make monocoque, you have sheet, aluminum sheet. If you have space frame, you will use die castings and extrusions you, uh, to make the space frame. So these aluminum alloys, uh, you would say, well, you know that their density is much lower than that of steel, so it would be an obvious change to make, certainly uh, because you can see the properties are very close to this, the properties of the steels we already use, yes? But that masks a number of things, yes? Uh, you know, you're probably familiar with aluminum. You know, there's nothing wrong with aluminum. It's very plastic. You see the elongation very high, yeah? So what's, you know, why not use it? Uh, well, there's some hidden challenges. One of them is that the strain hardening is low. So if you, 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 you take a, an aluminum and you deform it a little bit, it doesn't harden as much as steel. So your body is weaker, yes? Um, and the strain rate sensitivity is negative. What does that mean? That means that it's harder to make high quality pressings, yes? Yes, and the material will give you more difficulties in during press forming. And that's, that's how you make body parts, is by press forming with a die, yes? 
So this low rate. So there are manufacturing challenges when you use aluminum that do not exist yes, if you use steel. Hmm? I'll say a few more words about this in a moment. But I want to stress uh, to you the fact that so uh, steel is not used because the steel industry forces everybody to use it. It's used because it's in demand. Yeah? People need it for application. And in particular, while we're talking about cars, I, I want you to know that um, um, steel, this, this competition between materials has always existed. You know, it's uh, very often, you know, uh, people present this as if uh, uh, this materials competition is something new and dangerous and, you know, a challenge that uh, steel industry has never faced, yes? But, uh, you know, for instance, and there's some really interesting things, but for instance, uh, over 100 years ago, yes, uh, when um, people started building cars, and these are it's a series of, of cars from uh, uh, Loner Porsche cars. Loner is the, the company and Porsche is the designer. It's the same Porsche as the Ferdinand Porsche from the racing cars, right? It's the same person, yes? This is, these are the cars he designed early in his career. Uh, there's no steel being used here. Uh, cast iron and some, uh, and wood mainly, yes? And there's also no internal combustion engine. These are electrical cars, all three of them. Yeah? They used to win all the races, yes? And without using a drop of gasoline. That's 100 years ago. That's actually how the, steel, the car industry started. Electrical cars and no steel, yes? In the... Um, Yeah, and then um, you know the internal combustion engine uh, was invented and developed, and it was very clear that um, the performance of the internal combustion engine could not be matched by electrical motors. So um, this whole uh, early electrical motor vehicle development was pretty much stopped. Yes, uh, but about uh, and, oops, and then steel was used. In the 50s, for instance, this car here, yes, is a uh, French car maker that doesn't exist anymore called Poir Lovesseur. Uh, they used to produce cars, aluminum cars. There was nothing special about this. Yeah. My, I, when I was a kid, I used to go in, you know, my aunt, uncle had a car like this, so yeah, very well. Um, so these cars were very, very common. You know? This is not a luxury car. This is a very common brand in France, yes. Uh, other, in the 50s also, there were companies, startups, uh, making electrical vehicles. This, for instance, this, this car called the Henny Kilowatt, yes. Um, um, they made very few of them because nobody bought them, yes? But, you know, electrical cars, uh, non-steel vehicles, it's always, they've always been around as al alternatives. And nowadays, um, there is a, uh, uh, new materials, yes, are being tested, yeah? And as you know, um, uh, carbon fiber reinforced um, uh, polymers, composites, are uh, used, for instance, to make the frame of the i3 uh, BMW. Yeah. The i3 BMW is a car um, that has Samsung uh, SDI batteries, yes. And uh, STL is an American company that manufactures automotive um, carbon fiber reinforced composites, yes? And it has an aluminum chassis, yes? Yes, to give it um, strength and to uh, carry the batteries. Uh, this car 
um, uh, is very lightweight, yes, despite the very heavy uh, 230 kilograms of uh, battery pack. It's 1,250 kilos um, in total. So it weighs actually very sim similar weight than a you know, small steel vehicle. Yes. So competition, and this is in steel, uh, in the automotive industry, in other fields, there is competition too. So that is not new. Again, what is the driving here? One, very often the driving force is mass containment, yes, because uh, steel has a density of 7.8, yes, grams per cube, centimeters, and if you use titanium, you can half this. Uh, aluminum, even less. Magnesium, not even two grams per square uh, per cube uh, centimeter. And plastics are even uh, lighter, of course. However, uh, engineers don't make materials. Don't make materials with density. That's not a property. Uh, it has an effect on the mass, but you, stiffness is important for structures. Mm -hmm. Strength is important. And then if you want to make something out of them, formability of a material is also important. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at, for instance, the modulus to have an idea of the, the stiffness, um, steel has a modulus of typically 210. Uh, titanium is already half that amount, uh, aluminum a third of that amount, magnesium a fifth, and plastics have no stiffness whatsoever. So if you want to make something stiff out of magnesium, it will have to be more voluminous, right? So the advantage of having a lower density it's not really 100% because you need to use more. In other words, you need to have a, 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 your, your part will have to have a larger cross section, yes? Uh, just to, so you get the stiffness right. The strength is, of course, also important. Now, here we have to be careful because there are many different steels. You can have very soft ones, you have very hard ones. Um, you can have many different titanium alloys, aluminum alloys. It's, it's, uh, so in particular, when you look at titanium, titanium properties cover very much those of steels, yes? With the advantage of, um, yes? So, um, but you can see here that um, if you want um, very high strengths, hmm, like 1,500 mega, a part with 1,500 megapascal, of uh, 1,400 megapascal of yield strength, let's focus on it, yes. Um, it's going to be impossible to, you know, to get this with a plastic. Uh, magnesium, you will have a hard time finding that material, et cetera. Hmm? It doesn't exist, basically. Same thing with aluminum, et cetera. So when it comes to very high strengths, you have a problem, yes. You don't, you, there are not many alternative materials. Hmm? Um, and finally, now I do have to say here, I didn't put in the carbon reinforced uh, composites and they do have higher, you know, higher strengths here. So. And then you have the formability, um, because in general, um, you know, if, if you want to make parts, you, one of the easier ways uh, with high productivity uh, to form uh, nice parts is press forming. It takes very little time to make a lot of them. Yeah? So, and you can see here also that uh, the, 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 the range of uh, elongations you get with steel products is very much larger than uh, the elongations that you can achieve with alternative materials such as aluminum, magnesium, etc. Okay, so we have some strength uh, aspects to see. So as a consequence, we, see, you know, we s still see that 
in very many applications, steel is the material of choice. Yes. Uh, construction applications, definitely. Uh, you, you're familiar with reinforcement bars, structural steels, bridge cables. Yes. All of them made of carbon steels. Um, roof tile panels, interior of uh, the, uh, the buildings for ventilation and uh, air conditioning ducts, roofs sometimes, stainless steel in this application, yes. Um, packaging, furniture, uh, very often we have uh, steel products being used. We look around this, this office, this um, lecture room, we don't see the steel, yes? But it's there. Uh, for instance, uh, this, this, most of this desk is actually steel, yes? You, so when we, and, but you look at it, you don't, you don't think steel, right? But actually most of it is steel, yeah? And again, if all these, if we would remove the paneling, yes? Uh, everything you would see behind the paneling would be steel, yes? Mostly steel. Pipes, uh, structural uh, steels, etc. So, uh, of course, you know, consumer appliances are um, uh, made uh, of steel. Um, very often, I already discussed the automotive applications. There are certain applications where um, um, even if, uh, you know, you, we would start to use posits or uh, to make cars, you would not be able to replace that easily. And um, in uh, power and energy uh, applications, for instance, that's the case. You know, electrical steels, yes, so steels that are used to make uh, electrical motors, very tiny ones to very big ones, they're all made of steels, yes? made of steels because of the uh, electrical properties of steels and the magnetic properties of steels, as you know. So electrical motors, transformers, uh, all our en entire energy grid depends on very high quality uh, power transformers. They're all made out of steel, yes. And, and you cannot just replace it with an alternative material, hmm? okay? Okay, in oil industry and shipbuilding related to the oil industry, oil and gas industry, uh, rigs like these, offshore rigs, um, this uh, tanker here, uh, gas for gas transport, this um, carrier here, all of, all of these are made 100% carbon steels, yes? so. Very, and this is for the oil industry. Uh, so not only the structures, but all these pipes that go into making and, trans and, and into uh, uh, getting the oil and gas out of the ground and um, transporting it. Uh, all of this is all of these are is made of steels. Okay, so we have a material that has very very uh, uh, high demand. It's got the right in terms of price. It's not uh, excessively high prices, um, and uh, there is a lot of it available, yes? There is another uh, big strength that steel has, yes? It's um, the price stability, yes? Uh, many uh, materials are very sensitive to what are called speculative price changes. So where people buy uh, material just for financial reasons, to speculate on price changes. Hmm? Aluminum, magnesium, titanium, zinc, um, nickel, what? the prices vary, fluctuate a lot more than for steel. And the reason is because people buy 
and sell nickel just to buy and sell it, to make money on the transactions. They're not interested in uh, using it. In any way, they're just interested in uh, making money on that commodity. Yes, This is something that is totally absent in, for steel. Yes? The price is determined almost exclusively by demand yes, and supply. Yes? So, and this is one of the things that's really important because if you're going to, if you're a big car maker like Toyota or um, Hyundai or GM, uh, you don't buy 20 tons of steels, yes? You buy huge amounts of steels, yes? And so you make big contracts with steel companies over long terms, yes? And so it's very important that the price remains the same, yes? Because if the prices fluctuate, yes, there's going to be ad additional cost. Hmm? Because you will have to take an insurance, yes? to protect you against very big changes in the price. They, if the price will double, yes, uh, you have to have an insurance that will take care of this change in, yes? So you have to get to hedge your, um, yourself, you know, protect yourself against these fluctuations. So things become more costly, yes? Right, okay. So, so much for the general introduction. We will now start with um, basically reviewing the basics and uh, of the um, physical metallurgy of steels. Yes, mm -hmm. and as you can see here in these micrographs, uh, one of the important things to do is to. Uh, to look at microstructures in steel. Yes. And, but when you talk about microstructure or structure of steels, it's important to um, realize that there are many scales of microstructure. Mm -hmm. For instance, there is the macro, what we call the macro scale, the mesoscale, and the at atomic stick scale. Yes. And obviously, you know the macro scale, that's, you know, uh, Meters, you know, something you can capture with a camera. There's something you can see. Yes. Um, mesoscale, it's what you need an optical microscope for. Yes. If you want to go down to atomic scale, you will need an electron microscope, high resolution machine. Yes. And all these things are important. Yeah? For instance, it may be that you observe here a crack in your material, yes? Visually, material is, is, is a crack, yes? Uh, this crack may be due to grain boundaries that uh, decohesion of grain boundary because of grain, for some reason there is grain loss of grain boundary strength, yes? You would be able to see this decohesion at the mesoscale. And the atomistic scale would allow you to, you could see that this decohesion is related to segregation of sulfur or phosphorus at grain boundaries, for instance, yes? So, and this all is microstructure. Hmm? So microstructure spans many scales. Hmm? So we'll talk about this microstructure and we'll begin with very simple things, of course you're familiar with that, is when we look at a steel, this is for instance a steel, it's a martensitic steel, yes. Uh, it looks uh, like a, um, you know, what does it look like? It looks like, you know, it looks very complex, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're actually looking at is a polycrystalline material, yes? And what these things are here, these, these long things, are what we call lats, lats, and we refer to this structure as lath martensite, yes? 
And although it doesn't look like it, if we would uh, be able to uh, uh, look at the crystal structure here, it would be as ordered, yes, as crystalline as the single polycrystal of mag magnesium oxide or the crystals you're familiar with in the quartz crystals. It's the same, it's a crystalline, it's an agglomeration of crystals, yes? So there is a crystal structure to, to steel, yes? And we know that uh, crystal structures, and this is one of the crystal structures of steel, is we have translational symmetry, you have symmetry axes, symmetry planes, and other symmetries, and anyway, what we will be using in the course is this unit cell here, yes? And so if you translate, if you repeat this unit cell in three dimensions, you can recreate the atomic structure of one of these lats, yes? Of course you know this. And we know that there are uh, two important, for steels, important um, crystallographic variants. Hmm? Uh, that's the BCC variant and the FCC variant, hmm? which we uh, call respectively, um, uh, we call ferrite and austenite respectively. Yeah? And this is the BCC, this unit cell for alpha iron, yes? In our polycrystal, it basically means that um, we have this unit cell, yes? Uh, orientation is different from grain to grain. And that's why where these two grains meet, uh, there is a mismatch, small or large mismatch in the orientation. And that's why you can etch these, uh, etch these boundaries, yes? And make the, the mesoscale visible, yes? yes? The orientation, the relative orientation of these unit cells can be random or can be textured. If it's textured, it means that the difference in orientations between these unit cells from grain to grain is not very large, yes? So there is a pre, what we call a preferred orientation or a crystallographic texture, okay? Certain products, such as sheet products, wire products, have, can have very pronounced textured, textures. Okay? Again, you're familiar with the two crystal structures that, you, that exist for iron, for pure iron, alpha iron, which is BCC. This is the, unit, the BCC unit cell. You know this from introduction to material science courses you've had as an undergraduate, I'm sure. And you have the FCC. Uh, structure which we call gamma iron or austenite. Yeah? See here, very different uh, unit cell. And this phenomenon is called polymorphism. Yes. Um, you see here that the unit cell dimensions are very well known, about 0.289 nanometers for alpha iron. And it's larger for gamma iron. Yes. Now, it's, there's one important thing uh, uh, to, to um, not to forget, is that although the gamma iron lattice parameter is larger, yes, this is the high density phase if you compare the density b between alpha iron and gamma iron. Yes? This has a higher density because here I have more atoms per unit cell than here. Here I have two atoms per unit cell. Here I have, here I have two atoms. And here I have four atoms per unit cell. Okay. So the higher density is this one. So when I go from ferrite to austenite, there is a decrease in size, in dimensions, yes, or an increase in density. Just to make sure um, you, you're not confused, so if, you, if I have a piece of steel, yes, 
and I, it's ferrite at room temperature, and I heat it up to a temperature where the, transforma the phase transformation occurs, yes, then the sample is smaller. It's, it's reduced. In other words, I have more atoms are closer together. The atoms are closer together. I get a higher density. Yeah? So the density goes up here. Density goes up. Same number of atoms, right? It also means that if I go from here to here, yes, from high temperature to low temperature, I have an expansion. Yes? Okay. So here in this direction I have contraction. In this direction I have an expansion. So that means that with the transformation there will there may always there are always stresses involved. Yes, because when you when you go you cool down something, the temperature is not the same everywhere, but it can be slightly cooler in one area than the other one. So the transformation will not be homogeneous, yes? And so you may have internal stresses as a consequence, okay? All right. So polymorphism, BCC iron, FCC iron, and FCC iron is a higher density phase, yeah? yes? Okay. So this uh, change in from high temperature FCC to low temperature BCC in carbon steels occurs at around 912 degrees C for pure iron, yes? For pure iron, yes? Now, in steels, yes, and in any other material that undergoes a phase transformation, yes? The phase transformation itself is a function of the temperature at which you do this phase transformation, and it will also be time dependent. A phase transformation can be very quick. This transformation from here to here can be very quick or can be very slow. Yeah? So there is a time dependence and there is a temperature dependence. Yeah? So for instance, this, this, this is here. Um, let's do it the reverse. If I go from austenite I cool down to ferrite, all right, yeah. So I know, as I said, the material will expand, yes. Um, I, this is at 9, uh, 12 degrees C, yes. But I can do this transformation at a different temperature, yes. I don't have to do it, yeah. I can do, for instance, transformation at 800 degrees C, yeah. And the transformation will not be sudden, not, you know, instantaneously, uh, the material will not instantaneously transform from austenite to ferrite. There will be a kinetics, in other words. So you have phase transformation, kinetics are involved in the polymorphic transition from gamma iron to alpha iron. Hmm? Gamma alpha. And we present this in um, diagrams, which we'll discuss, uh, repeat a little bit in um, the coming, um, the coming uh, lecture, for instance. But it holds these um, uh, transformation temperature time diagrams are applied to uh, production steels. In particular, for instance, this is an example here where you have a runout table that's a part of a strip mill where uh, after you've deformed the material, hot deformed the material, you cool it down to coil it, yes? So first you have a, an, a temperature time uh, uh, diagram. You have a fast cooling rate to the coiler and once the material is coiled, the temperature change as a function of time is much slower. 
You have a much slower cooling rate. Yeah? And this is the transformation from gamma to alpha in this particular case. These are the kinetics. It starts at this temperature, yes? yes. So well below the, what we call the equilibrium temperature at which the transformation should start, yes? And then it, there is a certain kinetics here and um, we'll see what the transformation here to perlite, the impact is of the transformation to perlite is as we go, all right? Of course, steels are not pure iron, yes? They're alloyed, they're alloyed, yes? And um, as the name says it already, carbon steels is you know, one of this, the elements that um, is present in, these, in the steel will be carbon. And it, this carbon may or may not play an important role. For instance, in wire products, yes, carbon plays a very big role because we use a lot of carbon in wire products, yes? In um, very soft steels that are used for demanding formability applications, we use extremely low carbon content. So the co effect and impact of carbon is minimal, yes? So it pretty much depends on the application, the type of steel. But we, all these steels, we call them carbon steels, yeah? even though the carbon uh, range can be very um, uh, wide and the impact of carbon can or cannot be uh, important. Yeah? So steels are not pure iron, they're iron alloys and we have interstitial solutions. That means that we have small interstitial carbon atoms and to a lesser extent nitrogen atoms, yes? We have interstitial uh, these interstitials, in particular carbon and nitrogen, yes, um, will be interstitially located in the lattice, yes. And uh, there, we know from um, studies over many years that th the favored position of the carbon atom is in the octahedral positions, yes. B b uh, both in the ferrite and in the austenite. Yes, so this is, these are the octahedra in the ferrite, and there are many, this is one of the octahedra, there are many different oct uh, octahedras, yeah? And this is the octahedra in the austenite, yes? Okay, now I want you to, it's important for you to realize that the size, yes, the size of the octahedron, yes, the, the, the size the, the, the space available here, yes, and the space available here is very different, yes? So the diameter of the octahedral space, okay, just before I uh, go on, you have to realize that because I, um, to make the crystal structure clear, very often we draw the unit cell like this, yes? When we do this, we make the iron atoms very small, yes? The iron atoms are, are much bigger than this. Actually, they touch each other. In, in this direction, yes? In this atom, this atom, and this atom, touch each other, yeah? So, but if I would do this, if I would draw them real size, you wouldn't be able to see the crystal structure very clearly. So we make them smaller, yes? But the atoms are actually much bigger, yeah? and they particular along, along this, these diagonals here, they touch each other, okay? So the, 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 the space here, the octahedral space is small, yes? And the diameter of this is, is tiny, hmm? uh, 0.038 nanometers. And it's, and it's much larger in the case of a uh, austenitic octahedral interstices. This has a very big uh, uh, implication. Carbon is not soluble in f ferrite and it's very soluble in austenite. Yes, so this is a very important thing you have to remember about um, ferrite and austenite. It's the density aspect 
And the other thing is that in steels where you have carbon, carbon is soluble in austenite. It is not soluble in ferrite. at room temperature. But then you will ask me, why, why is it then that, you know, when I was an undergraduate, they told me about iron in uh, ferrite? Yeah. And why are you drawing it here if it's not soluble? You know, what's the point? The point is, is that that's the equilibrium situation. Carbon cannot be, is not soluble in ferrite at room temperature. But when you process steels, when you mix steels, you are rarely in equilibrium situations, yes? So you, you process materials quickly, you have very high cooling rates, and you can keep elements that are not supposed to be in solution, you can keep them in supersaturation, yes? It also means that if you give the material, the, the, the material a chance to get out of the lattice, Yes, it will do so very quickly. Hmm? In the case of carbon, you know, you, you may not know, but uh, the carbon will very quickly make a carbide called cementite, okay? As soon as it gets the opportunity, yeah? All right. Okay, so, and, and so what happens basically um, uh, when the carbon is kept in solution, it will this is this, uh, this octahedron in uh, BCC, it will distort this di octahedron, yes? And so this elastic energy is, is, is relatively large and constitutes a driving force for the precipitation, yes? Or formation of, of carbides, yeah. Okay. Um, when we uh, uh, think of steels, we not only think of uh, 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 carbon in solid solution, but we also uh, have alloying elements in uh, solution. Yes. So, for instance, elements such as manganese, silicon, chrome are common uh, alloying elements to steels. Yes. And so, they can be in solution in the steel. What that, and then they are substitutional solutes. I mean, they replace iron atoms. Yes, on the iron lattice. Mm -hmm. So, some of these atoms may have a, a, a size similar to that of iron. Yes, they can be larger or they can be smaller. For instance, if you have chrome, manganese, and moly, they're larger atoms. Yes, so around these atoms there will be a lattice expansion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Other atoms can give rise to lattice contraction. And silicon, or aluminum will contract, would make the lattice smaller. Yeah. Um, the, when you add alloying elements, whether it's carbon, nitrogen, chrome, manganese, etc., you will also change the thermodynamic stability of the alpha phase and the gamma phase, yes? So that's another important point, yeah? Thermodynamic stability. And so, as a consequence, you may favor the formation of austenite relative to uh, ferrite. The other thing that alloying elements have is they influence the kinetics of the transformation told you that gamma transforms to austenite, uh, uh, gamma transforms to ferrite, yes? It will do that with certain kinetics. If you alloy the austenite, the kinetics may change. Why would the kinetics change? Well, take for instance carbon, yes? When you're making ferrite from austenite, the carbon doesn't want to stay in the ferrite. And there is a process called partitions, and it partitions to the austenite that's transforming. This process, yes, this process has an impact on the kinetics, yes. So alloying elements have impact on 
the kinetics and the relative stability of the phases, okay? All right, okay. Now, so we're close to finishing, so, and because the part I have to, I'm talking about, it takes uh, more than one minute to start, I will stop here. So as I said uh, earlier on, we have one quiz a, uh, a week, because we just started with the introduction today. There's no quiz on Thursday. There'll be the quiz next week, yes. And um, yes, and that's basically it. And um, I, will, I will put the, um, the lectures on the um, e-class for you to uh, look at today. Thank you very much.